CEO Council of Fiji and the Australian Government-backed Market Development Facility. Our event is entitled Achieving Contact Centre Success Offshore with a case study by Spotlight Retail Group. We'll run for uh, exactly one hour. And during this time, we hope to spark your interest and engage you in the conversation around the opportunity to extend your operations to Fiji through outsourced partnerships. We'll be kicking off with the spotlight case study, followed by a panel discussion with the leaders of three contact center outsourcing companies in Fiji. And to conclude, we'll have uh, time for some audience questions. So think of your questions as we go along. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sharon Melamed, Managing Director of Matchboard. And I'll shortly introduce our first speaker, but just before I do, and we'll waiting for just a couple more to join. Uh, I'd like to point out some quick housekeeping. Firstly, we are recording this event. Secondly, if you have internet issues at any point, you can use the phone number and passcode provided in your calendar invitation. Uh, finally, could I ask that you stay on mute uh, just to prevent outside noise for speakers until we get to question time. Now, just before we kick off with the spotlight presentation, uh, we have a welcome message for you from Fiji's Minister for Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, Minister Fayaz Koya. Give me 10 seconds to share my screen with that video. Hope everyone can see that. Hello everyone, welcome. We live in times of uncertainty, but as with any new challenge, the new reality also presents wonderful opportunities. Fiji is perfectly positioned to take advantage of these opportunities and, and the new ways of doing business. Whilst the Fijian economy has been adversely impacted by COVID-19, we are optimistic that we will rebound. We intended to do this by focusing on the revival of the tourism sector whilst expanding our economic base by looking at existing and emerging sectors. The ICT sector, specifically uh, business processes, outsourcing, will be critical for Fiji post-COVID. As the minister responsible for commerce, trade, tourism and transport, I'm confident that Fiji is well placed to leverage the BPO sector. We have the right resources, a well qualified Fijian workforce, and necessary infrastructure for businesses to collaborate with our BPO companies. I therefore invite you to virtually witness and consider outsourcing here at our home. Unquestionably, the success of any outsourcing venture comes down to the people who deliver the services. Fijians are our greatest asset, as I'm sure many of you know from holidaying here. For that reason, we look forward to welcoming you to doing business in Fiji soon. And thank you. So I hope everyone was able to hear that video, uh, which we were gr very grateful to the Minister for. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Bernie Nielsen at Spotlight Retail Group, uh, a company I'm sure everyone's familiar with as one of Australia's leading homegrown retailers. Bernie is going to present Spotlight's journey outsourcing to Fiji. Over to you, Bernie. Thanks, Sharon. Afternoon, everybody. Um, as you head on, Bernie, from, um, from Spotlight Retail Group, and I look after our outsourced contact centre operation in Fiji. Just a little bit about me. I first joined Spotlight in uh, 1984, so I was quite young. Um, I did leave for a little while. I've been back for around about uh, six years and um, four years joined the um, shared services to uh, come into the current role. And I've been here for four years now, just by the way. Um, through our presentation, I'll share some information about why Spotlight have been in Fiji for over five years now and what the team actually do there. Let me go to the uh, next slide. Thanks. Um,
for anyone that uh, might not know about Spotlight, and I'm, I'm sure there's not too many out there that uh, don't, um, just to give you a little bit of background. It was first started by a young immigrant family um, in the Victoria markets uh, selling fabric. Uh, they had two sons, Maury and Reuben, who, uh, who used to go with them every day. So the parents would sell some fabric and the boys would race down to the wholesaler and buy a little bit more with, uh, with the earnings to come back and uh, be able to sell it again. Uh, from there, the boys did take over and they opened their first store in 1973 in, uh, in Malvern in Victoria. Um, while expanding the spotlight presence um, around Australia, they launched then Anaconda in, uh, in 2004. Uh, Spotlight bought Mountain Designs brand in 2018 and relaunched it in 2019. And the latest acquisition being Harris Scarf, who, uh, who we took over last year. Uh, across all the brands, uh, we now have a presence of 250 stores uh, around Australia, um, into New Zealand, Singapore, and Malaysia as well, <clears throat> though it's only spotlight in uh, Singapore and Malaysia and New Zealand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whilst we first started uh, looking at outsourcing, do you jump aside there on me? Well, the company first started thinking about outsourcing in, in 2012. It wasn't until a few years later then uh, phone orders and e-commerce really started to gain some momentum, um, realizing that a call center was not in our area of expertise. Expertise We engaged in an outsourcing partnership with, uh, with MindPearl in 2016. Thanks, Ellen. Next slide. In summary, Fiji ticked all the boxes for an outsourced location. Um, while price is always a key consideration, um, the infrastructure and, and people are two of the main ingredients. Um, firstly, Fiji has a world-class fibre connectivity since the early 2000s uh, via the Southern Cross Cable Network, which is an undersea cable system which links Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Hawaii and the main coast of USA. The education system in Fiji means that all lessons are in English from primary school onwards, and then the education is still funded through tertiary, through two tertiary, tertiary levels. Can't get my teeth into place there. Um, this means that uh, the people have a natural fluency uh, and are easily understood, and the country has a very high literacy rate of over 99%. I know when we talk about offshore, um, people often think about long journeys and big time zones, but Fiji on average um, is about a four hour flight from Australia, main east coast. Um, I'm based in Brisbane, so it's even a little bit uh, quicker for me. So it means it's easy to get to and with a one and two hour time difference, depending on daylight savings, we can be in touch with our teams there in real time without any late night or early morning conference calls. Being in close, close proximity has also allowed us to bring the team member over for training um, when we've had major system upgrades as well. I think we've brought them over twice now, um, so it's nice and close and easier to bring them over here to, uh, to take back the learnings. As Spotlight work across quite a few time zones, uh, a 24 hour, seven day a week and a 600, 365 day a year uh, centre certainly ticked uh, a big box. Given the 24 hour operation, um, operating hours and public transport not being dur available during all those shifts, Mindpool also have their own transportation that pick up and drop off the agents with a frequent timetable. Um, Mindpool have on-site canteens uh, and allocate agents a daily voucher to, um, to enable them to be able to use on meals as well. It's reassuring that Mine Pearl are high, are high enough up uh, where they're situated to even avoid a tsunami, who thought until a few years ago that would be a thing, and have a building to cyclone code with a generator backup system um, for the loss of the, the electricity, which again has uh, certainly been utilised and, uh, and needed. 
Um, finally, for the slide, I'd like to mention the cultural affinity uh, Fiji to, to, due to its history have many similarities with Australia in areas such as the education system, the legal system, and of course, it helps that they're also sports mad. Um, I don't know if you know that Vicky Wilson, a gold medalist and OAM, was contracted to coach the Fiji netball team um, that have played around the world. And I had the pleasure of uh, talking to her quite often when I've been over there. Uh, Fiji are also um, huge on rugby and uh, have won four of the uh, World Rugby Sevens. Um, the nation is so proud of that, that uh, they even bought out a, a $7 note, which I thought was a bit counterfeit when I first come across that when I was over there. Um, I'm not too sure if they paid that other football code at all. Um, sorry, Victoria. Okay, just the next slide, thanks. Just to run through, location Suva, if, uh, if you're not aware, because I'm sure everyone is familiar with areas such as uh, Nandi and Danarau Island, um, probably where all the resorts are. Um, there is great snorkeling around there. Suva is just over the other side of the island, just uh, a 30 minute plane ride over to there, <clears throat> and is the capital of, uh, of Fiji. We started here in 2016 with a team of 16, and we've pretty much doubled that now with, uh, with 31 now on board. All the services are in English language and, and provides, uh, provide support to a number of markets, including uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. And my next slide uh, provides a little bit more detail about the actual services. It's the next one, thanks, Alan. Okay, there's a lot of detail on the slide and I'm not going to cover everything you'll see. Um, here, many of the uh, typical tasks you expect uh, in a retail environment, uh, general inquiries, order processing, order tracking. And while all the team are multi-skilled, we have a split uh, to voice and admin and uh, swap them back and forth so we can dedicate that. With, um, uh, with our inbound, we handle around about a thousand um, up to 15 inbound calls per day um, of just about anything you can think of. Um, we've given the team an open door to all our back office systems and can therefore resolve most cases as a one call resolution is what, what we aim for. Uh, they can raise the return labels um, for any goods that need to come back to us through Australia Post or even trigger our refunds and cancellations of orders through our systems um, if necessary. Well, we're not classed as an outbound uh, account, there's still the occasional need to call the customers on a case where we may need clarification on, or more information on the uh, query. Again, going for that one call resolution with the team. Our cases, um, and I call them that rather than emails through Zendesk, the CRM Zendesk and uh, Salesforce, predominantly come through the website, our, our contact us page, and we can receive in excess of a thousand of these uh, contacts a, a day. And the team aim for a 24 hour response time, though occasionally we do blow out to, um, to 48 hours. Okay, just the next one, thanks. Any change comes with its own challenges, um, training a whole new team in a new location. We spent considerable time in the planning and training, work concurrently onshore to offshore at the time before handing over the total range, uh, range to a very capable team in Fiji. When I came on board four years ago and, and visited the team, they had a list of about 50 very insightful suggestions that would make both their and the customer's journey a, a better one, so it was well thought out. Uh, this included our website, our systems, and even processes. Uh, just about all of these were taken on board and changes made over the next six months for them as well. So um, I know the team continually come up with new ideas or suggestions for us. They're the ones that use our systems the most. Um, and of course, who better to give us that feedback to, um, to improvement. While we have our own quality assessor and trainer on the account, we're lucky enough to be able to call on Mindpool's very experienced company trainer manager 
who always brings uh, very well thought out suggestions to the table to us as well. With uh, COVID management, um, let me start with where we were last year, even the, even the best thought out BCP would have had a hiccup with what the pandemic brought us last year. Stores closed, econ boom. Um, we were lucky enough that Fiji were not in the same boat as Australia at, at this time last year and were not shut down. Um, Mine Pearl had purchased some dongles on for us um, should have we needed to work from home over there. However, they weren't needed. We were all of a sudden faced with um, an absolute inundation of calls and cases with, uh, with everyone buying online or, or trying to or wanting to sign up and how do I do it and uh, wanting to chase where their goods were because it's important they get their pillow on time. Um, we were all of a sudden faced with 15,000 or in excess of 15,000 cases as a backlog to try and answer. So I was overwhelmed, the team was overwhelmed. It was uh, certainly something that we were faced with. Um, I was certainly um, grateful that Mind Pearl at very short notice were able to bring on board around about 10 extra agents for us to get through that uh, onslaught. And uh, I think to, even till today, we've got one or two extras still on there helping out as, um, uh, as different states open and close, as does the uh, fluctuation in uh, e-com as well. It brings us to now where um, Fiji are now forced with the restrictions. Uh, Mine Pearl were able to, at a very, very short notice, purchase some dongles. Um, I think we gave the go-ahead on a Friday morning and um, by Friday afternoon, They'd had everyone packed up on their own transport to get everyone home um, and all their equipment home before that lockdown come in to, uh, to play that same day. So I know their IT department certainly worked overtime in getting everyone up and running. Um, so the team are very effectively um, all still working from home and uh, probably will be for a while yet, but it's working very, very well, which I'm grateful for. Okay, Ellen, just the next one. Okay, just to finish off, this is a photo of our beautifully smiling, dedicated team, as well as some of the wide, wider support network from, uh, from Mindpill, and taken on my last visit uh, last February for our four year celebration. Um, unbeknown to me, the team actually a couple of days before had um, arranged to uh, go color coded. Uh, they're a very, very brand proud team. Um, so their colours were orange for Anaconda and uh, blue for Spotlight. So I, I can't wait to the next get together where they'll introduce the nice bright green as well into, uh, into that one. Lucky they told me the day beforehand and I did have my, uh, my Buller shirt um, packed away in my suitcase so I could wear that as well. Well, that's about it from me. And I, I, I thank you for listening to, um, to the Spotlight journey on, on outsourcing. Thank you so much, Bernie. Um, really appreciate all those learnings and insights. Uh, I'm sure everyone will have some questions and I would encourage you to pop them in the chat room so you don't forget them later. Or you can, um, in question time, turn on your voice and camera and ask them directly. Um, but before we move to those audience questions, um, I'm now going to launch a quick poll. Uh, so can everyone see on the screen a poll? Um, and I would uh, ask you all to vote in the next few seconds. And we're just asking, where are you on your outsourcing journey today? Outsourcing onshore, offshore, just starting to explore, likely to outsource in six to 12 months or none of the above. Would love to get maybe one or two more. Okay, I'm closing the poll in five seconds. And I am going to share the aggregated anonymized 
results with you now. Uh, so interesting uh, feedback there that um, virtually no one is outsourcing onshore. Um, I guess uh, cost is a major issue with the Australian market onshore uh, with outsourcers typically charging around $50 an hour and Fiji obviously less than half that. Uh, currently outsourcing onshore, we had 40% of people um, just starting to explore outsourcing, 24% likely to outsource in six to 12 months, 8%. So thank you so much for participating in that poll. That just gives us a, a pulse check. So um, we are now going to move to a quick panel discussion. And I've invited three of the leading BPOs in Fiji to participate. So we have Anthony Kassa from Centercom, who he's the CEO of Centercom Fiji. If you'd just like to unmute Anthony. We also have Alan Graham, who is the Chief Commercial Officer of Mindpearl. They are the outsourcer supporting Spotlight Retail Group. Um, and we have Luke Wiley from uh, Pack Leader Group. Hello. So hi, gentlemen. Um, so I'd like hey. to kick kick off, obviously, we've heard from Spotlight on some of the advantages they saw in selecting Fiji as their offshore destination. Uh, what do you view or what do your, your clients view as the, the primary uh, reasons that they're choosing Fiji over some of the more traditional outsourcing locations like uh, the Philippines and India? If I could just ask Anthony to throw in his comments there first. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Sharon, uh, Bernie, and everyone for, for turning up. Um, look, at the moment, because there's been different things over time, and I think Bernie sort of covered a lot of those, those reasons why the people traditionally would uh, be considering Fiji. But those, a lot of those issues have come into keen focus. That you know, The proximity, closeness, very important. The time zone, that uh, cultural closeness. And um, there's that familiarity, not just with, you know, between Fijians and Australians, but also having had the experience of their service culture. Many Australians have been up there, so there's that, uh, there's that familiarity. And that's all sort of now with COVID, in particular in the post-COVID world, that's, those, those issues have become more important. Um, you know, it, it, and, but also you've had, you've had people, companies that have traditionally been outsourcing to those, those other destinations you mentioned, Philippines, India, South Africa, that have had a lot of challenges over the last, well, more than 12 months now, so it's 18, almost 18 months. And luckily in, in Fiji, we, we have the natural borders of the sea. They were able to keep the keep very low virus numbers there and had a, and were able to trade all, all year with um, no disruptions. And I think either the, the word's gotten around, but also that's become, you know, we've had that proof of concept. And now that we're going into, um, you know, this more mature, uh, how to handle, how to, how to live with the virus. You, you know, Fiji's at the head of the pack with their, with their vaccination um, rollout. And it's put us in a very strong position now vis-a-vis um, -vis these other traditional destinations. Fantastic. Uh, could I ask uh, Alan uh, at Mindpo, uh, what additional insights do you have there on why people <laughs> are uh, selecting Fiji? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sharon. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, and thanks, Bernie, for, for the overview. Um, I think uh, probably the number one reason, and, and, and I would say this <clears throat> um, pre-COVID, um, the thing that sells Fiji, if I can put it that way, um, to our clients is ultimately the people. It's the, it's the affinity they have. It's the cultural understanding they have with, with markets such as Australia, New Zealand, and, and further afield to, to locations like <clears throat> the UK and the US. Um, it's very unfortunate that, that we're not able to do site visits at the moment because um, that, that's when people actually realize when they get to <clears throat> Fiji and they get to the center and they meet the people that they, they, they have that, that feeling of comfort that yes, this can work because offshoring and outsourcing, particularly if you've never done it before, um, people just want to, uh, they're very hesitant and can be very hesitant. So 
I think uh, it's the people. That would be my number one reason, Sharon. Uh, and all those other things that have been mentioned by Bernie uh, and by Anthony. The proximity, particularly as an onshore location, um, the technology is there, the infrastructure is there, and, and all those things. I won't repeat them, but uh, if I could pick one, I would say it was the people and, and their capabilities. The Bula spirit, <laughs> perhaps. Look, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, did um, Anthony and Alan cover any, everything that you might have added there? I think so. I mean, I, I may be in the same position as, as some of the people who were on the session today. You know, some nine years ago, um, we were looking after doing uh, a number of activities throughout the traditional BPO cent centres in Manila and India, um, which generally promises uh, the world and delivers an atlas. We sort of searched for something else and we had some connection with Fiji. Um, and our, our centre has traditionally been set up to um, <clears throat> look after our own business ventures. Um, and it's all of those things that has, has made it successful. But, I, I, you know, I think uh, Alan, um, you know, probably hit the nail on the head there. It really is the people and their ability to be able to uh, hold conversations and converse where we didn't get that quality of conversation uh, when we're in different offshore centres. So um, that's certainly been a, a real fillip for our business. So I understand, Luke, that with your business, you had an operations in the Philippines and you felt it wasn't meeting all of your business needs and then you set up in Fiji, is that right? That's correct. And, and we yeah. still have a small operation in the Philippines, but anything that we do in with customer interaction, um, it's all based out of Fiji. And <clears throat> actual most of our functions, HR, uh, recruitment, um, the, all of our Australian business functions are pretty much set up in Fiji as well. Yep. And I think it's worth pointing out that um, the Fijian accent in English is is very neutral. Um, not to say that the the Philippines accent is not intelligible, it is, but it is very American. <laughs> Whereas uh, I think perhaps all those Australian and New Zealand tourists to Fiji may have rubbed off uh, on the very neutral accent in Fiji, which obviously gets um, uh, correlates to the customer experience. Yeah, is, um, I mean, with our business, we're speaking to, you know, tens of thousands of people a day, and uh, it's always a romantic notion with Fiji when they don't quite pick the accent, where are you calling from or where am I, you know, where are you from, Fiji, and it's um, somebody's got uh, some good story to tell about, you know, holidays in Fiji or yeah. uh, their, their honeymoon or whatever it is. So Yeah, that's it. Actually, Alan, you mentioned about the site visits, and I just wonder when some companies decide whether to outsource to Fiji or the Philippines, whether at the back of their minds, they're thinking, well, if everything else is equal, where would I rather tag on a holiday to my business trip over there? And I think Fiji wins the day for most people. Would yeah. you say that's sort of a, a subconscious bias towards Fiji, that, that uh, uh, I, carrot? I would. <laughs> I would. That that always um, becomes part of the conversation, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it, it definitely does not do any harm uh, to the proposition. Put it that way. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, well, we have mentioned the word COVID, and I guess we do have to talk about it in the current environment because it certainly has um, had a major impact in a good and a bad way on the BPO industry globally. Um, Fiji, just so everyone knows, um, has a, a fantastic rate of vaccination compared to other countries, streaks ahead of India and the Philippines at this point, even ahead of the source markets of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so of the adult population, I believe 49% of Fijians have had their first jab. Um, and obviously, you know, coming back to that point about site visits, um, the ability to actually go to Fiji is based on this vaccination rate as an indicator would have to be much more um, likely to be sooner rather than later compared to countries like India and the Philippines. Would, would everyone agree with that on the panel? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so just on COVID, um, I think our audience would be interested to hear um, what Fiji's response has been and the BPO industry in general, what, um, what rules they've been governed by. Um, so uh, if I could ask perhaps Anthony, come back to you to just comment on um, how your business has adapted during COVID and if your clients were affected in any way. Well, um... We're, we're experts in Fiji at managing disruptions. Um, we, we, uh, 
especially some of the work that we that we do in, in the in the airline space. Um, but I think what was really positive is well, they were able to shut down straight away and close the borders, which meant they didn't get much virus in there initially, um, and very low case numbers. But we still had to um, we still had to adapt and set our systems up and people so that they are able have the capability to work from home. So what we what we and, and to test all that because you know in, in real time because we, we actually did um, over that time everyone had has been working at home at some stage. So we've got the capability to actually have a hundred percent of the people working from home. We're on the flip side of it now and we've actually because the vaccination rates are so high, we've got you know we we the, the office is now filling back up again in in that regard because a couple of weeks ago we had to put those uh, business continuity plans into place and again no disruption so i think a really good proof of concept from a technical perspective and all and that the and that 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 home environment did not result in a drop in productivity um which was was great but you know we we do like to have people in in the office and now we've put these high vaccination rates that we're rolling that program out and we've got teams back in the office all vaccinated and, and so on so um I think that's that's the experience that we've had as a company. So it was good that we that it forced us into a position to be able to have that flexibility, to be able to have both work from home and um, and in the office and mix and match as we need to, because you know things are ch things change all the time, and the, and the clients need that kind of flexibility or looking for that kind of, kind of flexibility. And in general, I think that in this you know it's people have to assess risk when they're outsourcing and um, you know, want to keep that to a minimum. I think that you know, Fiji, for all the reasons we mentioned before, and the way that it's been, that they've managed the, the, the pandemic, uh, that's put them in a very good position now with um, Australian companies looking, looking to go up there and, and see that less risk that they've got from potentially going to other places. Mm. Yeah, certainly um, at Matchboard, we're seeing um, a lot of companies that maybe are in the Philippines and India and South Africa um, looking to either supplement uh, those destinations with another one, um, such as Fiji, to um, reduce their risk, not put all their eggs in one offshore basket um, and, and just diversify that footprint. Um, and I think also the point you made about hybrid working, that is certainly a capability that uh, I think is here to stay that people will be looking for when they outsource. Um, Alan, would you like to comment on Mindpearl's experience during COVID, how it affected uh, your customers, your staff uh, and your, your business? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think it was a, an approach which, which saw uh, a collaboration uh, both internally and externally and <clears throat> you know we have to consider the staff uh, as a as a from a perspective not everyone can work from home um, it doesn't suit everyone and um, we also had to ensure that we we could keep the offices running so it was a case of collaborating and working with the government and the authorities to you know to get those permissions given the the client base and the services that we are providing out of Fiji, uh, the importance of those to, to whilst adhering to all the, the regulations and guidelines um, and restrictions, but, but keep ticking over as it were. So, so we, we, we've, we've been operating a hybrid model uh, for those that can work from home and prefer to work from home, then we, we've, we've been able to put that in place. Uh, in, in the office, from a practical perspective, um, we've we've <clears throat> readjusted our transport schedule because we we in fact run our own uh, transport buses to ensure that staff get to work and back safely, um, and and that's had to be adjusted to accommodate the different the, the, the changes in the working patterns, and also the office itself is very important, and, and this is something we've adopted uh, globally is to subdivide our office space. So that should we get a COVID positive case, then we don't have to shut down the entire operation. And we've spread our employees out so that not one client, for example, would be affected. So only one area would have to be shut down, deep cleaned, everyone would get tested. 
uh, and then we would be able to open that up again. But in the meantime, the rest of the operation could continue uh, across the client. So um, to answer the question, Sharon, it's, it's been a, a collaborative approach, I think, both with staff uh, to make sure it works for them and with, with the government and the authorities to make sure that we are doing everything within the regulations. And it's, been, it's worked, it's worked. Mm -hmm. And I know in the midst of COVID, Fiji's had a cyclone also to deal with. Um, and uh, it's obviously not the first cyclone that the country is fairly used to every year getting a cyclone or two. Um, and I do remember, Alan, I think it was a, uh, several years ago when the most powerful cyclone occurred in uh, the whole Asia Pacific region and hit Fiji and, and your operations just went on uninterrupted and and I was wondering if you could comment on that because probably it's something that um, some of the audience might be thinking about if they're looking at Fiji is how do yeah. the BPOs cope during a cyclone? Yeah sure I, I mean I'll let, let <clears throat> Luke and Anthony um, advise from their perspective but when, when we opened in, in Fiji in 2009, we actually designed the building from, from the ground up. So it was designed to, ha to, to um, encompass all those scenarios uh, in terms of whether that's power outage, whether it's severe weather. And we worked in and, and integrated all those aspects into our business. So we have our own water supply on site. Uh, we have obviously from a technology perspective, uh, backup generators on site. We have fuel supply nearby, um, and 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 everything that, from a technology perspective, will allow the operation to continue. Um, but also from a people perspective, um, we, we've got our own transport in place, and we would um, make sure that those that wanted to be at the office could actually come to the office and stay at the office, because we have. Um, uh, built into the operation our own canteen facilities, so catering, um, there's plenty of space there. So uh, some people actually during a cyclone situation feel safer in our building um, than they, they do outside of it. So we actually have uh, on many occasions, people just stay there uh, until, until the worst of the cyclone has passed. So it is very much um, being built with that in mind. Uh, because as you say, Sharon, the, 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 the tropical cyclone is not a one-stop event in Fiji. It's something everyone's very used to. But uh, I think it's just being ready for these things. And, and yeah, we, we've been fortunate um, that we have not lost a, a day of operation or, or an hour of operation since we opened in 2009 because of all those, those contingencies that have been put in place. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Luke, um, for just some comments to yeah. get a, a third perspective on how, as a BPO in Fiji, you've managed through COVID. Would you like to share your insights? So I'll just touch on that, the, the cyclone piece. I, I was actually, um, I was living in Fiji when Winston hit, um, and we were at that point in time doing a lot of work for Vodafone Australia. Um, we didn't miss a beat. In actual fact, the next day, there were some issues with uh, one of their other partners in India and we're actually taking overflow um, from, their, from their tech support team. So not only were we able to continue to operate, but we actually continue to operate and pick up work um, a day and a half after a cyclone hit. So um, as far as the, the COVID outbreak, I mean, look, our office and our operation is based in Melbourne. So on the flip side, we had pushed a lot of work through to the, the Fijian team when we were in lockdown um, and, and it was a seamless transition. And throughout the COVID period, all of that work has stayed and we've actually been able to build one of our teams um, within the last six months in Fiji from uh, an internal campaign from 10 to, to 50. So it hasn't stopped our growth within Fiji. On the contrary, we've been able to operate um, as per normal with all of the government's help um, and support and again, it, it's it's due to the people, and it's down to you know the resilience of of the Fijian people that we've been able to continue to operate. Yeah, can, can you just elaborate, Luke, on the government support? Were there a couple of initiatives that were very helpful to you? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, there has been certain lockdowns, but the BPO industry has been classified as an essential service, so we've been able to continue up to operate um, during those lockdown periods. Um, so yeah, you know. I think that certainly assisted our business. Mm, fantastic. 
Well, I'm going to wrap up the panel there. So we have um, 15 minutes at least for audience questions. Um, I would ask everyone who has a question, either um, type it in the chat room or um, go off mute. So I know that you want to ask a question directly, but I will read out one of the questions that's come through already. Um, and this was uh, for Spotlight, actually. Do you currently measure customer feedback? And uh, specifically, do you measure net promoter score NPS as a metric? Bernie. Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't, believe it or not, uh, measure, we don't have NPS at the moment, though we are investigating that. It just, um, we need to really think about what we want to get out that get out of it. With the, the feedback, um, we do have a very small team in Melbourne that handles all feedback, um, which is whether it's from our centre um, or whether it's from the stores um, and also takes care of social media. So not at the moment. I, I know any complaint does come through to me and if I was to to, to think about how many complaints as opposed to how many certificates at customer service awards I get to take over to the team, then it's a very, very, very small percentage. Do they get it right every time? No, um, absolutely not. Um, however, I guess it's the way they take the feedback. But we are looking at it, not, a, not currently. Okay. Another follow-up question to that came through... Um from Taimur, what is the impact on your customer satisfaction score measured before and after moving to Fiji? And I know, uh, Bernie, you came on board after the move had already taken place. So I'm not sure if you have that at, stat at hand, um, but uh, perhaps some of the BPOs could talk about uh, what their clients have told them in terms of the before and after move. Has it positively or negatively affected customer satisfaction? Um, Alan, Anthony, Luke, do any of you have any example that you could talk to there? And just go off mute. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that uh, we, it's, it, it's a difficult question to answer in isolation um, because of uh, you know, a whole range of issues, but um, essentially, we would operate the customer satisfaction and, 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 and customer feedback at a standard level. So um, nine times out of 10, the client's already got uh, a goal uh, to a metric to achieve. And you know, that, that is, um, that, that's, that's, that's the bottom bar if you like. So uh, what I would say is that um, the clients love Fiji. Um, they love the people. And, and it's a very difficult way to describe, but um, certainly across the phone, um, that, that personality of the Fijian um, com comes out very well. So I think for, for voice-based activities, uh, and, and, and this is a, a, an easier way to measure, is that the feedback and the customer satisfaction is, is not an issue um, because it's generally a very <clears throat> positive conversation. Uh, more difficult to measure that, and that's why I say it, there's, there's a number of factors involved here. Uh, measure it on, on an email basis or, or a web chat basis. Um, but overall, definitely positive. And it certainly has not uh, impacted those those metrics on, in a negative way at all. And, and I do know, Alan, that you have many clients who've been with you in Fiji for many years. And I guess that's a signal that if uh, there was customer resistance in any way that they, they wouldn't be continuing for over many years. Um, in that yes. operation. Um, we do have a question for Bernie. What is the relationship like between the team in Melbourne and the team in Fiji? So could you comment on those dynamics and what level of communication you have? Uh, with the onshore team, uh, as I said, they handle the, the feedback, the social media part. So <laughs> they probably have a totally different um, function. However, when um, they actually work well together, um, there's actually some back office systems that the offshore team uh, know back to front and the onshore team actually reach out to the, uh, the team for help and support when they might need to, uh, to get into it and don't use it every day. But um, they speak on the phone, they get on great. Okay, 
Fantastic. And there was also a question about for you, Bernie, while we've got you, how does Spotlight different, differentiate the brands? And that's probably, I, I think, in terms of the customer service experience, is there any differentiating level of treatment that the content center gives the different brands? No, we, we do the same across the board. I can't read that where that is. It's uh, running through there fast. Um, there's one level of service across all brands. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, we have another question uh, more for the BPOs. How do you handle security of your clients' data while your teams are working from home? Alan, would you like to answer that one around data security? Um, yeah, it's, it's dependent on the client and the work type, I think is the easiest way. Um, not, not, uh, we've been fortunate in that no work types have, have we been unable to do a work from home. So we do, we do have a, a, a range of client industry sectors, um, being handled out of Fiji. And, um, it's a case of working with the client to ensure that those standards are, are satisfactorily met. Um, so without going into any specific detail about any industry sector, and we do we do work in financial services, obviously in travel and, and retail, uh, we, we just ensured that whatever those security standards are, um, we are able to put them in place on a work from home basis. Um, and that could be, for example, splitting the workload. So if there's workload that, that is not suitable for work from home environment, that will not be done at home. Those, the staff that are remaining in the office would do that work. Um, if, that, if that answers the question, it's, uh, it's, it's different for different clients, but throughout the COVID period, we've, we've managed to, to, to work around that and split the workload accordingly so that all those, all those standards are still being met. Okay. Anthony or Luke, did you have anything to add in terms of data security um, in the operations or did Alan cover it? No, Alan covered it. We also... Yeah, Okay, okay, no worries. Um, now there's a question uh, from Glenn, which is for Bernie again. How many Australian resources do you have supporting the offshore team? What sort of roles support the offshore team within the Melbourne headquarters? Supporting them? Um, in a the service role on shore, I don't know if you'd say support them. I think I said before they they're very different functions onshore to offshore to uh, to what they do. Um, they complement each other in in the roles that they have. So there's you know other than um, me that overlooks it all. We've got our ecom team that supports them, but there's um, there's no onshore offshore because they're they're separate. They're different. Yep. Okay, so it's just yourself. Um, that's great. Because um, obviously, when people look at outsourcing costs, they do have to factor in what level of resource they uh, need uh, within their own business to support that offshore. So it sounds like it's quite a stable operation uh, in Fiji running on its own engine. Um, we do have another question about the ratio and this is more for the BPOs, I think, um, the ratio of customer satisfaction to cost. So um, the comment was, of course, uh, BPOs like Manila because um, it's scalable and the cost. So a company may choose to live with a lower level of customer satisfaction for voice call center services because of the significantly lower cost. Um, would any of the BPOs like to comment on with Fiji? Can you actually have your cake and eat it, get the lower cost and the great customer experience? Or do you have to compromise a little bit like in Manila with the customer satisfaction? I don't think you're compromising as much. I mean, as I said, it's the reason that we chose to, to set up in Fiji is, is the customer interaction. In actual fact, um, you know, PAC leader, whilst working with Vodafone Australia had leading NPS scores, and that included their call centre in Tasmania. So, um, you know, I think given the history in service, um, the expectation is that it should be just as good uh, as onshore. Anthony, would you concur with that one? Absolutely. I think, you know, Fijians are a very happy people in general, if I can generalise, and that comes through on the phone. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd say that you're... you're 
and people, our our people, as as Alan said, are our greatest. You know, that, that's uh, yeah. I'd say that. Uh, yeah, the, the, you've 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 got you've got the similar type of kind of performance that you get in Australia um, at the very least, and the people you've got in Fiji really like the kind of job that they've got in the call centre. And I'm not sure if that's the same as uh, in other locations, but you know, a very bunch of very happy people. Our staff retention levels are very high accordingly because it's a kind of a, a very well sought after job. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, we have a wonderful work in, workplace environment in, in our particular location. It's right near the ocean. Um, no, it's a, definitely we're an employer of choice. So that, that translates to that kind of um, product, productivity, efficiency, and ultimately happy rapport with our clients' customers. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, I know not every country has um, the same advantage there where call center jobs are considered highly valued. Um, and so in Fiji, um, it is a role people aspire to, especially when they're serving international clients in uh, state-of-the-art facilities. So um, there is another question that's come through from Joanna. Um, how are KPIs managed for contact center metrics, particularly if they are not met? Would anyone like to put up their hand and comment on that one? Yeah, I can say that one, uh, Sharon. The, <clears throat> the, the way they're handled is, is, is the way you would expect it to be. And, and, and if I can just link that to the previous question, um, th there is no compromise in Fiji. Um, I, I mean, yes, there, there, there is a cost uh, advantage and a cost efficiency, but it doesn't mean that you are going to receive a, 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 a less worthy product. Uh, you, you, when you get the opportunity, and hopefully um, you all will at some point, you will find that Fiji and the operations in Fiji are, as you would expect, were you to walk into a contact center in Melbourne or Brisbane or Sydney or London. It, it's the same standard. And <clears throat> that goes from a technology perspective through to a quality perspective, a training perspective. So if KPIs are not being met, then you know you 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 flag that you 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 <clears throat> give your attention to that individual or those individuals or that that product um, that's been supported, and you look at it and you do retraining and you do refresh your training. Um, if, if that answers the question, it, it would be handled exactly the same way as as any other uh, sort of international um, contact center operation. It wouldn't be any different or any less uh, thorough in Fiji because we are operating to very much an international standard. And uh, from, from my perspective, um, some of our clients, <clears throat> yes, are, are Australian based. Um, some of them are, are based overseas. And uh, in many scenarios, we will uh, support a client in multiple locations. So depending on the day of the, or the time of day or night, that call could arrive in the Fiji center or it could arrive in, a, in, in a, my case, in our South African center. Um, we have to ensure that the same standard is met regardless of where that call is handled <clears throat> because that's the expectation of the client. So there has to be a consistency and uh, Fiji is no exception to that, um, if that, if that answers the question. Thank you, Alan. Uh, question for Bernie, what percentage of inquiries can the Fiji team resolve at first level? I would love to be able to give exact data on that. Unfortunately, uh, we're fairly new with uh, Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce doesn't, uh, well, we've got a plug in, Salesforce doesn't talk to, uh, to Touchpoint. Um, and given that a lot of our contacts come by phone, I, I, I have to apologize and say I can't quantify it. Okay, okay. Um, there's the question that's probably on everyone's lips, but uh, one person has been game to ask. Thank you, Taimo. <laughs> Can you give some indication of cost per customer service agent, including the BPO's fees? Um, I am gonna say a couple of things before I turn over to the, the panelists um, based on my experience. Firstly, um, I will be following up with people after this event to see if they would like an indicative uh, quotation from the Fiji BPOs. Um, 
secondly, I would comment that the costs from my experience are on a par with the Philippines. Um, when I recently looked at actual invoice data, two of the BPOs were slightly less expensive and one was slightly more expensive than the Philippines, so very much on a par. Um, in terms of a range, uh, it really depends on whether you want a traditional outsource model or a, more of a staff leasing model, because the two have quite a difference in costs. But uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and give people a range um, that it's sort of in that 10 to 15 Australian dollars an hour range. But um, Anthony, Alan and Luke, please don't kill me. Uh, what are your views? Did I, did I give uh, numbers that you would uh, be happy to give clients? Yeah, I think you've, you, you, you've nailed it there in terms of range, but it, it's, it really comes down to skill set. It depends. And that's one of the good things about Fiji is that you've got that broad range of, of um, skill sets to draw on in, in, the, in the populace. Um, but yeah, it comes down to skill set. If you're looking for a customer reservation, reservations agent, it could be one cost if you're looking for someone to do back office accounting, it could be a bit different cost if you're looking for someone to do loan application, loan applications, it could be a different cost again. It really depends on what kind of experience and skill set. But as a range, I'd be comfortable with that. Before you and can. Luke yeah. is nodding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have time for just uh, one more question. Sorry, guys, thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, from Danny, is there much flexibility around being able to increase resource to cover times of peak sales or if there are systems issues and then reduce again when the workload drops? Uh, can you comment on the flexibility of your workforces? Anthony, Alan, Luke. Well, it, sorry, jump in there, guys. It depends on the amount of training. Um, and again, on, on, on the skill set and in terms of what kind of pools we have, we, we keep pools of um, temporary uh, pools of temporary workforce to be able to resource up and resource down. And we, but you do need to train those 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 pools up in in the in the tasks. So working with the customer over time, yes, you can build in that flexibility. If someone comes to you tomorrow and says, can I have 50 people for a week and then, I need, and then it's going to drop off, it doesn't quite work like that. But if you can work with the client over time, you can, um, you can certainly build in a lot of flexibility. One other quick comment from Ellen or Luke before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with Anthony. Um, the, the, the availability of resource in Fiji is not the issue. It's, it's what you want to do with that resource. So as, as Anthony said, um, what skill set do you need? Yes, yes, we can ramp up. Yes, we can, we can get um, peak coverage. Um, but how much do you need that person to do? And you have to be practical in terms of uh, how, how much training can you give that resource, that person in a very short time. So it's, uh, yes, it's available and there is flexibility, but you have to be realistic about what you want to achieve. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, so brilliant, that brings our event to a close. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, to everyone who attended, to our sponsors, the Market Development Facility and the BPO Council of Fiji, and to Bernie, our guest speaker, thank you so much for giving up your time. Uh, we will be sending around a short survey to get your thoughts on today. Uh, and I should also add that this is the first in a series of four online events we'll be running. This was a contact center theme. Our other events include an HR recruitment and uh, a finance and accounting theme. Should any of your colleagues be interested in that, uh, do let me know. Uh, wishing everyone a wonderful day ahead. Stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.